Hello. Today we talk about Discourses of Discontent, the Progressive Era 1890 to 1920. So we're now moving into the 20th century uh, and looking at roughly the first 20 or so years uh, of uh, this century. To start with a quote from one of the really good books uh, on the Progressive Era, uh, succinctly put, the author says, Progressivism demanded a social transformation that remains at once profoundly impressive and profoundly disturbing a century later. So we will be looking at both the upside and the downside of the Progressive Era, and uh, you can judge for yourself at the end whether it deserves uh, the name progressive, uh, um, at least in the uh, dictionary definition of what progress uh, is supposed to mean or does mean which gets us uh, back to kind of uh, semantics, or st starts us uh, off uh, with semantics. So why do historians call this the progressive era? Because progress means to improve or get better over time, as it says. Uh, so was America getting better between 1890 and 1920? It depends on who you ask. So depending on your political views, depending on... Uh, your values, depending on the way you see things, your frame of reference, this era uh, might deserve the name progressive, uh, again, connoting that progress was made, improvements were made in American society, uh, or not. Uh, but that's not the real reason uh, that the progressive era uh, has, you know, is used as the uh, preferred label of historians uh, uh, today. The real reason uh, is that uh, the era was dominated by the progressives, uh, as they were known, actually called themselves, and the progressive movement that they led. So progressive era sometimes, I think, misleadingly assumes uh, that uh, what what's being labeled there is the improvement, sort of upward uh, right uh, movements on the graph. Uh, the society was getting better, uh, for sure. So it can be uh, misleading in that in that sense, but when we realize that it's really the era, uh, the label uh, is about progressives and the progressive movement, then it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that things were getting better. What it does mean uh, is that progressives and leaders and proponents of the progressive movement thought that American society was getting better, or thought that it would be getting better once progressive ideas were implemented and put into law and into practice. Uh, but uh, there's no denying that whether we approve of the progressive measures uh, that were promoted uh, and or put in place, that this movement dominated American politics and values uh, for a generation and still has great influence today. Again, progressives uh, uh, then, so-called, uh, and uh, people who label themselves as progressive today have a great deal in common, and there's, of course, a connecting, a connecting thread between progressives then and now. So what was the progressive movement? Well, it was promoting change, and of course we mean change for the better, but was it for better uh, or for worse? Well, as we said... Uh, in the previous slide, or I said, I guess you didn't say it, uh, but uh, it depends on who you ask. But what was it that the progressive movement was pushing for? Uh, what was it that it actually did? Number one, uh, it saw uh, and used uh, a, a stronger role uh, for government. Government reform, uh, meaning government programs, laws, agencies, uh, that uh, were uh, to be used to push America uh, in the right direction, to, to make it, uh, again, uh, better. So uh, reform of uh, corporate uh, activity, uh, government regulation of big business, uh, uh, liberalism was in the driver's seat here. And another political term uh, that's still in use today Liberals and progressives sometimes are used interchangeably today, uh, and not, not always. And here, we're kind of using progressive and liberal interchangeably uh, in, in this uh, you know, these early decades of the 20th century. So the idea here, which was really new in American history at the time, was that government uh, is supposed to play a, a, a very 
strong and powerful and maybe the most important role in improving American society. Remember that heretofore we've seen in this class uh, the more traditional approach to government, which goes back even you know to the beginnings of our republic uh, in the late 18th century, that government had a much more limited role, uh, that right, limited government, the phrase, going all the way back to uh, England, John Locke, the great philosopher of uh, and thinker uh, of limited government, that government's role was to de defend and promote uh, freedoms, uh, uh, individual liberty, uh, life, liberty, and property, as Locke had it. Thomas Jefferson in the next century, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, changing the phrase a bit into life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that government's job is to promote those freedoms, those liberties uh, of uh, individuals, uh, and not much more than that. So it uh, protects uh, rights to property uh, by some police, you know, mechanism, policing mechanisms, protects your right to property and life and limb, uh, by uh, keeping the borders safe from invasion, uh, collecting some taxes uh, here and there. But there weren't such things as social programs. Uh, and th the idea was totally foreign uh, to Americans uh, and to uh, the American value system. We saw a dress rehearsal for a stronger role for government already when we dealt with Reconstruction, when uh, things like the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, albeit temporary at the time, uh, but were government programs, social programs designed to uh, insert the government more actively into everyday American social life. So the progressives are now pushing uh, that notion of government, uh, a much more uh, active role for government uh, in American society and life uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And for the first time, the ideas weren't brand new, since we saw already a dress rehearsal, but this is the first time that such ideas become dominant. Uh, and they won't stay dominant. Uh, the, uh, the other side, the opposition to progressive reform and to progressive notions of active government, uh, conservative uh, notions, uh, kick back into place. Uh, after World War I uh, in the 1920s, when we get there, we'll see that it was a conservative-dominated decade, uh, which uh, tried uh, and to some degree succeeded in rolling back progressive reforms. Again, reform is a word that always connotes a change for the better, but if you label something a reform, it, it's still uh, open to question whether or not it is better, uh, but it's always used to make it sound like, well, how could you argue with this? It's a reform. Uh, but uh, So progressives uh, thought their reforms were good, uh, good for America. Conservatives or non-progressives, they weren't always, non-progressives weren't always conservative, but uh, they, they didn't necessarily think the reforms were, in fact, reforms. Sometimes they thought they were harmful, as we'll see. Uh, another uh, aspect to the progressive movement, beliefs and goals of progressives was to change American thinking, change American values uh, from uh, to from individual thinking, individual liberty and freedom, which remember uh, is sort of a bedrock notion and value going all the way back to our founders, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, but the progressives are saying individual liberty ha has uh, proved insufficient and even harmful. Uh, uh, as a, a major value, and it needs to be de-emphasized, and we need more collective thinking. So uh, our society would be much healthier, will be much healthier, if uh, instead of uh, p uh, an emphasis being placed on your uh, and my right to freedom and do what we want, that there's more emphasis placed on what's good for the whole, what's good for the collective, what's good for the group. Uh, what, it's not about you, it's about us. So this is another uh, sort of ma major component of the progressive movement. One historian uh, who wrote a classic book decades ago on the progressive era uh, with the title A Search for Order, which you see here, uh, he didn't put a question mark at the end of uh, uh, the title. I do because uh, it's open to argument uh, whether or not the uh, 
progressive era is defined by a search for order, but I think a strong case can be made for it, as the uh, author, historian who wrote that book, uh, th this was his thesis, uh, and that is that uh, the progressive era can be seen uh, and understood in light uh, in particular, uh, of what follows the Gilded Age. In, in essence, that the progressives themselves looked back at the Gilded Age, the decades that we've just covered fairly thoroughly, and they saw massive disorder. They saw way too much competition. Look at the economy and the, uh, the uh, creative destroyers we talked about, like Mr. Carnegie and Rockefeller, and all the labor wars that we've recently uh, uh, dealt with, uh, the Homestead Steel Strike, the Pullman Boycott, etc. So, in, in that, and, and many other ways, uh, some historians, ever since this book was published, have then seen, while the progressives are trying to order and organize society uh, uh, to get rid of uh, the chaos uh, that they saw uh, in the Gilded Age. So, but that, of course, then, uh, it relates still to the previous term uh, here, the previous uh, uh, bullet point, collective thinking more than individual liberty. So, the search for order uh, is, in a way, a search for collective solutions to problems that come from too much competition, individual competition between individual citizens, between corporations, between uh, one institution and another in society. Also, the progressive movement was dominated by middle class values. Uh, no doubt about this. So, uh, and, and this uh, middle class uh, group, which w was largely what the progressives uh, were made up of, tried to, as one author historian has said, impose a uniform culture based on their values. So, middle class values uh, were the dominant ones uh, of the age. It might be thought that that's always the case, that uh, America has always thought of itself as a middle class country, that everyone's in the middle class, whether that's literally true based on their income and wealth, that we tend to think of all as sort of the middle class. That might be a myth. Uh, uh, I mean, even the fact that we all think of ourselves uh, the same way and have the same values. But it isn't true that middle class values have always sort of been the dominant way of thinking uh, in the uh, in the country. But it is true of this particular era, of this particular uh, progressive generation. The progressives, at their most confident, or we might say overconfident, actually believed that human beings could be remade. Individuals could be uh, uh, basically reshaped and reformed from the, uh, and really from the top down. That uh, experts, scientists, uh, professionals uh, could uh, and would uh, change the individual uh, in order to change society for the better, uh, to make progress. So not only did they think it could be done, they thought it needed to be done in order to uh, achieve uh, all of the progress that they see uh, as necessary and beneficial. Lastly, the social gospel. Uh, this is the religious element, or religious wing of the progressive movement. So social gospel, uh, not all Christians uh, were supportive of the social gospel, uh, but those that uh, were supportive of the progressive movement uh, are usually sort of uh, fit un uh, put under this uh, uh, category, under this umbrella called the social gospel. They were often evangelical Protestants, almost always Protestants of some uh, type or another, uh, but who happened to have progressive views, at least on some things. That's not to say that the religious wing always uh, agreed uh, with the non-religious wing of the progressive movement, but there was a great deal of overlap uh, here, and we'll see it some as we go on. Also, to dispel any misconceptions up front, to say, talk about uh, the sort of religious uh, and non-religious progressives, I'm not saying, because it's not true, that the non-religious progressives weren't religious personally. Uh, the non-religious ones, uh, I, I'm just saying that their commitment to progressive values and progressive institutions and goals and reforms weren't 
motivated primarily by religion. The social gospel movement and those that were a part of it were motivated uh, largely uh, for religious reasons, but sometimes other reasons uh, uh, supplemented their uh, uh, concerns. So who were the progressives? Just to give a thumbnail profile, uh, right? Uh, this is quite simple, but they're usually white, educated, middle-class professionals, and usually men. Uh, we I put uh, a couple of famous women on there as well, who will meet, because there were uh, women involved in the movement, sometimes uh, a, a people of great importance uh, in the progressive movement. But nonetheless, uh, it was still mostly male-dominated. So white, educated, middle-class professionals, it's important to understand this simple profile uh, because it helps us to see, and, and we're going to fill in a lot of the blanks as we go on, uh, what was lacking in the progressive movement. So the fact that it was white-dominated uh, already then sort of gives us a clue to some of what it left out. Uh, there we'll see quite a bit of racism. You, in, in some cases, you can see extreme racism. Uh, here, uh, uh, anti-immigrant sentiments or nativism, as we've already labeled it in a, a previous unit. Uh, and so these white, educated, middle-class professionals, they had their blind spots, to be sure. And I'm not trying to villainize any of them. I remember, my goal uh, in teaching history uh, is really not to moralize uh, one way or the other. I make an occasional editorial comment here or there. I have views, but uh, I like to try as best I can uh, to uh, look at things from as many different sides, or both sides as possible. You know that's an emphasis uh, in this class for you as well as me. I forced you into it. Uh, so uh, we're going to look at uh, the positive and negative side. But by looking at this sort of overall uh, broad profile, uh, we can already sort of see where some of the uh, the blind spots uh, are, are, are going to be. We'll see some others as we go go on. You might you know go back to this simple formula uh, uh, to fill in further uh, gaps. What were progressive values? And some of this uh, is a repeat of the previous slides, but I want to make sure we sort of pin this down with kind of increasing detail uh, from slide to slide. So one, uh, the visible hand, uh, as it's been called, of administrative government has a strong and positive role to play in American society. So we talked, right, already about the idea that government has a stronger, bigger, active, positive role to play uh, in American daily life uh, and society. But administrative government, we haven't mentioned yet. That will come up more. This means that government agencies, which are coming into being for the first time uh, in most cases here, uh, they will be expanded in later decades, as we'll see, as American government uh, gets even bigger uh, from the Great Depression uh, forward. But uh, we already see uh, this uh, as a big change, uh, the belief by progressives that Government, uh, especially administrative agencies uh, like the U.S. Forest Service, as we'll see, the uh, Justice Department, the Department of the Interior, etc., etc., eventually be like the today the federal, uh, the FCC, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, etc. But they believe strongly that these uh, kind of government agencies, part of the executive branch of government, as one after another got added, housing and urban development today, that they must uh, uh, right to be there to regulate business activity, uh, to protect uh, Americans, and average citizens and consumers, uh, and to fight uh, excessive liberal individualism that uh, uh, government uh, not remember that or keep in mind that administrative government right uh, isn't necessarily including congress or elected officials uh, the administrative agencies of the government then and now fewer than a lot more now are under the control of the executive branch and the president uh, so it takes into account the executive branch and the president, but not so much elections uh, uh, to Congress, not so much uh, a role by the people, uh, uh, at least through their elected representatives. And this is uh, one of the places where it, this uh, way of thinking ignites controversy. Uh, 
so its critics, you see in green here, uh, believe that th this is the this era uh, sees the origins of the administrative state. Uh, that's meaning these critics now, uh, but also they already saw it coming then, uh, and believe this is just too much government uh, and too much government again in, uh, in in some ways unaccountable hands because administ uh, administrative agencies don't have officials who are elected. They're either appointed uh, by the president uh, or they have jobs, uh, they're lifers, as is uh, sometimes called, uh, is sometimes said, meaning that they stay in their jobs as civil servants, as bureaucrats from one administration, whether Republican or Democrat, to the next. So uh, administrative government, uh, the administrative state, as it becomes known from this point forward, uh, and which is reviled today by conservatives, uh, and they trace uh, this back, not incorrectly, to the progressive era, its beginnings to the progressive era. So they think this is too much government, and particularly too much government uh, in the hands of unaccountable uh, administrative uh, agencies and administrative activity. They also uh, think, the, the critics thought and think then and now, uh, that uh, equality, uh, the equality that uh, the progressives are uh, about, uh, partly why they're fighting liberal individualism, uh, is a huge threat to liberty and freedom, uh, partially because it, th that's what they're trying to do, is de-emphasize uh, freedom uh, uh, to promote equality. But it goes further than that. The criticism also uh, uh, entails a, a, a fundamental belief that for equality to prevail, it has to be enforced. And so it has to be enforced by someone or some institution, uh, and then that institution or that group of people have power, uh, right, uh, that uh, violates the whole principle of equality. So uh, to uh, critics of progressivism, to critics of uh, progressives, again, in the past and even in the present, uh, it's often believed that they're, they're attempt to create and promote equality in American society is impossible uh, because the equality has to be put in place uh, and uh, kept in place by someone, some group, or some institution, which gives that institution, that group, greater power uh, than anybody else. So it's not equality. At least that's the viewpoint. Uh, secondly, the progressives uh, believe strongly in the efficiency uh, of experts, they they they, they promoted efficiency. Uh, I mean, this is a a pet peeve of theirs. Uh, they wanted everything to be as efficiently run uh, and uh, uh, laid out in American society as possible. And they believe that experts, technocrats, uh, people with uh, degrees in business administration and engineering, and um, social scientists, like economists, sociologists, uh, can uh, plan. Uh, and run uh, and design institutions uh, and ideas uh, uh, for policy that will make American life better. So this also dovetails into the first point uh, about administrative government, uh, but this uh, in some ways is the origins of a strong uh, uh, modern state. Now, administrative government, on the positive side, uh, w without administrative reforms and strong administration, at least from an historical perspective, going back centuries and moving uh, closer to the present, you can't have strong governments uh, that protect citizens and promote uh, uh, and help uh, an economy generate wealth uh, and improve standard of living uh, without a strong administrative uh, function uh, and uh, you know a framework. But it's possible that at some point it can go too far and go from being necessary to being uh, right to overkill. So the critics, uh, again, uh, both in the past and the present, think that too much power uh, is in the hands uh, of government uh, uh, when uh, you have put things, uh, uh, you know, you have government experts or government hired experts uh, in uh, different uh, fields that require a great deal of training and uh, education, uh, that th these are the kind of people that have too much power in, in critics' minds that sort of make things unequal. Uh, 
uh, that the experts then, they're, they're trying to bring about equality, but they have so much power in their hands uh, to control uh, American uh, economic, social uh, life uh, that uh, it's uh, it takes away from liberty, takes away from freedom of the individual, uh, takes away from individuals' rights, uh, and uh, uh, is indeed harmful to American life. What if the experts are wrong? What if the experts are in a position in a government agency where they get to make decisions that affect the lives of millions uh, and the people, the public, uh, don't have a, a say in it. Uh, an individual farmer doesn't have a right to say, I don't, uh, I don't like this. Uh, I don't, uh, who, who's the expert who decided that? Uh, that's not, uh, it's not in my interest and I don't want it. So to the critics, uh, this is seen as uh, uh, too much power in the hands of the government and too much power than in the hands of a few people uh, and, and, and group of people within government. There was a strong belief also uh, among progressives that the environment shapes the individual uh, and that if you improve the environment significantly, uh, the individual society uh, will itself be improved significantly. So uh, this is, in a sense, a simplification of the uh, long-raging conflict up until the uh, present, currently going on between nature and nurture. This is the nature and nurture argument. So the progressives were decidedly uh, on the side of uh, nurture uh, over nature. Uh, and this is one of the ways that you can see that progressive views uh, are still powerful even today on college, uh, university campuses across the, the country. Uh, many professors, especially in the social sciences and humanities, uh, uh, very much emphasize nature, uh, I'm sorry, nurture over, over nature. Uh, they very much emphasize and believe that human beings can be shaped, uh, improved, uh, changed, uh, physically uh, even, uh, but also uh, right socially, uh, educationally, etc. And there's less emphasis on genes, less emphasis on uh, human nature having fixed properties, uh, 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 to it. Uh, and the progressives of the early 20th century uh, uh, believe the same thing. Their critics, again, then and now, uh, see uh, this belief as wildly overconfident in human reason's ability uh, uh, to, you know, change things. Uh, they think it's, you, you're in a sense, trying to play God uh, and changing nature and, cha and trying to change human nature, which critics of progressivism, at least those that are conservatives, were conservatives, are conservatives, uh, see as wait, wait, there, there is a fixed human nature uh, and you're, you think you can go back and uh, tinker with that and change it. Uh, it seems an act of hubris. Uh, from the non-progressive uh, and or conservative uh, perspective. There's also, uh, and, and this is, uh, this third point uh, will get us into uh, ways in which the progressives uh, thought that they could really sort of step in and change uh, uh, the individual, that they could change uh, uh, Americans uh, kind of like, uh, you know, in a laboratory uh, experiment uh and it gets to that in, in some cases. Another strong uh, element to progressive values uh, was the belief that information leads to reform. That there's, and we'll see, there's all kinds of ways in which information, uh, useful, necessary, uh, you might say, was being uh, brought to the American public uh, on a scale, uh, you know, unknown hitherto. But that there was, this, in some ways, naive belief among the progressives, uh, that once uh, the American public knows that something is uh, a problem, an issue, needs to be reformed, needs to be changed, uh, that Americans will overwhelmingly pressure their elected representatives and pressure the government so that reform will be just around the corner, so that a progressive reformer uh, who wants to uh, bring it into child labor as the progressive movement did, uh, right? If they just, their belief is if they just publicize it enough, if it's written about in the newspapers and enough books and magazines about what an awful problem it is, once American citizens are saturated with that knowledge, they will be so appalled 
that uh, uh, they will force the system, government, uh, corporations, you know, American society to make the necessary changes uh, in a more moral uh, and more practical direction. Uh, Thomas Leonard, uh, uh, another uh, historian, writing uh, a, a book recently about the Progressive Era, although his book, as you can see from the title at the bottom, Illiberal Reformers, is a more critical approach uh, to the Progressive Era than the other ones that I quote and use uh, in this uh, unit and lecture. But he says, Progressives use the language of anti-individualism, efficiency, and anti-monopoly for varying purposes, but nearly all use this rhetoric that the revolutionary consequences of industrial capitalism required rethinking and reforming American economic life and its governance. To them, laissez-faire, which means hands off, government stays out of the economy, was not only morally unsound, it was economically obsolete. Whatever free markets once accomplished, they now produced uh, inefficiency, instability, inequality. America needed a new form of government, disinterested, uh, which means uh, neutral, unbiased, uh, nonpartisan, not Republican or Democrat, scientific, and endowed with discretionary powers uh, to investigate and regulate the economy, as well as compensate those exploited, injured, or left behind. So, much of that uh, sounds good, uh, and in some ways it is, but there are some holes in it uh, that critics, as we'll see, uh, uh, you know, poke uh, and find uh, uh, quite easily. For instance, the idea that the new form of government, and this could be uh, seen to uh, mean the experts and bureaucrats and technocrats we were just talking about, that they'll be disinterested, nonpartisan, and scientific when they're appointed by progressives and the people that get the jobs are progressives. Okay, but then doesn't progress, isn't progressive a point of view, a viewpoint, and coming from an ideological perspective? So then how would they be more disinterested and nonpartisan than, and purely scientific than anybody else? Uh, but so there's a, 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 an example of an issue. What did progressives do? Uh, I mean, we saw what their values were. We saw kind of the overall definition of what progressivism means. But what kind of specific uh, programs, what kind of specific changes uh, did they make? What, what, what their activity, uh, right, uh, as political activists, as they often were, was directed towards what changes? Uh, well, I've just kind of picked out uh, some of the primary ones. But there was a push for more popular participation in politics. Uh, so we see the initiative and referendum system go into place uh, in many states, not all this time. Uh, the recall uh, in many states. So at the state level, uh, there are uh, ways uh, being put into place to get the uh, public more involved. The initiative and rep referendum system, California had it from then on, has it still to this day. This is when you go to vote and you see uh, proposition, whatever. Propositions are a way uh, that the average voter, the voting public of any state, California being just one, can, uh, if a proposition is on the ballot, they get to vote on whether this proposition becomes a law or not. Uh, and so right, that, that circumvents, at least in those cases, legislators who usually make the laws, right? Most laws uh, at the state, national level, are made by elected politicians at the state level, right? In the state senate, in the state assembly, uh, right? And then signed into law by a governor. But this is a way to circumvent that, to say, hey, under certain circumstances, if this gets enough signatures uh, on a petition, it goes on to the ballot uh, in the next election uh, as a proposition numbered, you know, one through you know, whatever it is, uh, and uh, if the majority of citizens of that state uh, uh, or voters of that state vote in favor of it, this becomes a law whether or not the politicians uh, uh, like it or not. So uh, this is a way to inject uh, more uh, public participation, direct democracy into American politics. Was it a good thing? Is it a good thing? It, again, it depends on who you ask. Uh, but uh, you can make a case uh, that it did 
uh, it has proved beneficial. Uh, we'll talk about it more. The progressives also wanted government, however, to be more top-down uh, in terms of its power. So they tried to push through uh, reforms that n not only... Th these two things sound contradictory. In some ways they might be uh, more popular participation, but then more top-down uh, power. Uh, so how do we square these two things? Well, let's think of it this way. Top-down power is executive power. So a president, a governor, uh, etc. Et so in a sense, the progressive... Okay, so executive power, let's, put, let's have three tiers. Not that the one at the top is necessarily the most powerful, but president or governor at top, an elected legislature uh, beneath that, and the voting public below that. In a sense, what the progressives are doing uh, and believe is necessary and a better way to get things done is to, as much as possible, they don't mean entirely, but they want to cut out the, the middle man, the, the middle group here, the uh, the legislative institutions, Congress, a state legislature, and have more contact directly between the executive, the president or governor, uh, and uh, the voting public, so that it's the the president that connects with the public, becomes wildly popular uh, in the public mind, and that president then with the the, the, that voting power, uh, right? Uh, that uh, uh, that base of people, if it's big enough, uh, powerful enough, uh, that the the president, the executive, the governor can get more done uh, uh, more directly without uh, involving Congress as much of the time, without involving uh, elected uh, uh, politicians much of the time. So the executive branches uh, at whatever level are trying to sort of, in a way, uh, push legislatures, uh, elected officials aside, I mean, elected legislative officials aside, uh, and get things done uh, through a direct connection with the people. They also, the progressives, uh, wanted to employ techniques, uh, and did, uh, of scientific management uh, to uh, as many uh, aspects of American life, uh, as many institutions as possible. This is where they, they really saw a need for experts, uh, 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 technocrats, uh, who would improve the efficiency of administration, bureaucracy, of government institutions, streamline them both in the public uh, and private sector. The progressive movement also, as we, this part we've already seen, uh, called for more regulation of big business, uh, more antitrust law, more antitrust suits, uh, you know, it's more watchdog agencies over uh, corporations, more regulations, uh, reining in free markets uh, so that it would protect your consumers uh, and uh, citizens. The progressive movement also focused on trying to stamp out corruption uh, in politics and business, and uh, this uh, is one of the areas where I could think we could see mostly positives here, uh, that uh, this was these were necessary uh, reforms and changes. Campaigns for social justice, uh, another uh, big uh, uh, element of the progressive movement, uh, and uh, the goals of social progressive reformers. Social justice didn't mean then exactly what it means now. Uh, it was uh, primarily uh, about uh, pushing for uh, right the, the rights and, and better conditions uh, for workers, uh, and uh, a uh, a campaign, uh, a long and drawn out campaign to push to end child labor, uh, to uh, improve working conditions for women uh, who had jobs, uh, etc. Didn't so social justice didn't quite have the wide berth of uh, groups that it was trying to uh, bring justice for, uh, that would uh, come in time in later decades. There was also an attempt to stamp out vice. What is vice? Well, vice uh, uh, usually means uh, right things that uh, sins uh, from a religious perspective. So campaigns against vice usually promoted most strongly uh, or uh, completely by the religious social gospel part of the progressive movement but campaigns uh, against vice meant campaigns against drinking, gambling, prostitution, horse racing, pornography, etc., etc., etc. 
Uh, and so the progressive era uh, is known for trying to uh, uh, clean out uh, uh, vice uh, and you know, sinful behavior uh, as, as well.